cultivating the wilderness thing is um, those of you who were here will remember uh, a very fascinating talk we gave about his book Why Architects Draw, which was intriguing and very confusing and sometimes very contradictory to us. And, and, uh, some of you will know Ed because he's been with us now for the whole of this week in the graduate school in the Housing and Urbanism Program and in seminars and discussions. For those of you who don't know Ed, he doesn't like to be introduced, uh, so I'm not going to say anything about him. Uh, he will say what he wants to say about why he wants to talk to a group of architects uh, and what it is he has to say to us this evening. So I'll hand straight over to you. Okay, I have all this machinery. Can you hear me? I hate microphones, so can you hear me? I'm loud. I'm from New York. I, it's not a problem. Just, uh, you learn to speak loudly in New York. I'm an anthropologist by training who has been working with architects on and off for 25 years, which I think explains something of my personality. Uh, get myself in trouble early. And today I, I want to talk about something very different than what I talked about last time. Last time I talked about something that was done. Now I'm talking about something I'm just beginning in, which is why I want to talk to people about rethinking the nature of cities. It's become a very hot topic in the world for a book I'm starting to write. So bear with me today. It's not going to be as, uh, <laughs> it might be catastrophic. It won't be as organized as my talk on drawing. I've all day been wondering which talk to give. I have two different talks. One I give sometimes and think about giving to architects, and one I think about giving to social scientists and social theorists. Bear with me. Today, I'm going to try to give you both or at least a bit of both, and then um, hopefully open up some discussion. So let me say, if I gave both talks, it would be about two hours. I'm not going to do that. Uh, although I must say, it's always amazing to me in architecture schools how long talks do go. Social scientists would walk out. But uh, I will talk hopefully for about 45, 50 minutes. Is that right? And then, hope, and then people will uh, hopefully ask questions or make comments or whatever else it is you want to do. What I am talking about, oh God, can, can I get rid of this? I'm too loud for a microphone. I really am. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is the potential we have as both designers and as social scientists to uh, rethink the city <coughs> and to rethink it as a multiple site rather than a singular site. It seems to me that one of the great problems in thinking about cities, even those who want to talk about multiplicity, including myself, so that this is only a sort of beginning, is that architects, planners, social theorists tend, when they talk about the city, to what I call singularize it, whether in image or in plan or in text. They, they more often than not fashion an ordered and unifiable whole out of what is often a disordered, spontaneous, even intractable multiplicity of people, places, and practices. The irony is that even those who often speak about multiplicity, which is now the buzzword, at least in the States, I don't know about the UK, but in the States everybody has to be talking about multiple and multiplicity and complexity and others. Even those people, when they speak that way, actually singularize the city because what they reject the possibility of having is some kind of unifiable whole. So what I would like to talk about today is the possibility of rethinking a city which is both multiple and unified at the same moment. So that multiplicity, for me, has to do uh, both, has to both think of cities in all their totality and all the unity and also think about them in all their multiplicity and conflicts and difference. And the question I want to think about doing, or developing, or dealing with, I'm not being very articulate, God, I hate this, is to respond to 
the question posed or the statement posed by Michel de Certeau where he says that we have to find a way to think the very plurality of the real and to make that way of thinking the plural effective. So I'm not only concerned with finding a way to rethink the city, I'm hoping in rethinking the city that we can begin to rethink and react and create new forms of both architectural and social practice, which hopefully would improve what most people would admit is a relatively dismal situation in the world. But it's also, see I can't say that because it's also a very joyous situation at the same time. If we go back to, and there are very different ways you can do it, and I'd like to, the way I'd like to talk about today is to talk a little bit about the kinds of singularization that's going on that I see, then show you some slides, this is an architecture talk, right? and show you how by looking at sites we can begin to see the extraordinary complexity and contradictions that exist in cities, and then very briefly and very quickly go through a series of slides of architects who I think are addressing this issue in various ways, because I think architecture can, uh, unlike much social theory, address this issue, and that's a side issue about what languages we can use to talk about multiplicity. One of the um, subtexts, I hate that word, but I'll, I'll use it, of this talk and the whole work is the problem we have in language of dealing with multiplicity that is simultaneous. Because language, as Steven Pinkus likes to point out, cannot deal with simultaneity. At least the English language can. You all know what I mean by that? The example he always uses, if you talk about someone kicking a ball, you will either privilege the kicker or the ball, but the action itself is simultaneous. The kicker does not come before the ball, the ball does not come before the kicker. They come at the same time. And if you have someone saying the ball is being kicked, or the girl kicks the ball, the boy kicks the ball, and you see a picture of it, the kicking is at the same moment, but the words are separate. So there is a problem in, in trying to find a way to describe multiplicity in the world. The other problem is that most people who write about cities, be they social theorists or architects, tend to want to privilege one or another part of the city. I think about zone one and two. Has anybody seen that? When I was growing up, that was a very important issue. It was the first thing that Sanford Quinter put out. So it was the first thing which was in a form that was unreadable to social scientists. And it was also the first issue to really begin to rethink the city. And in the back, there is a number of people were asked a number of questions about the city and thinking and rethinking the city and what their response to the city was. And a number of very famous architects and critics and theorists were asked to respond to this question about where they si think the city is going, what the city is, so on and so forth. What's amazing about almost all the responses is that even though they all differ, they're all the same in a sense that they all want to take a piece of the city and make it stand for the whole or they want to take a single process and make that the privileged process through which we can understand a very complex thing. Examples. A lot of the architects, people like Muschamp, who now is the critic of the New York Times, Mel Charney, and a lot of the social critics like Saul Yurik, rue the loss of the great, exuberant, chaotic, and informally ordered and energetic reality of the 19th century city. They all, and it's a very common thing in the architecture, so is how do we get back to this wonderful public life, this wonderful sort of engagement of others in the same place? It speaks to a real thing. I grew up in the Lower East Side. It was a very energetic and spontaneous place. But it avoids the issue of the fact that it was also an extremely violent, racist, and dismal place. It is one thing to live in Soho of New York or to live in the many gentrified working class areas of London when everybody makes above $50,000 or 50,000 pounds. It's another thing to live in the Lower East Side that was the densest place in all of the world. And intellectuals often forget that. So what they are nostalgic for, even less than intellectuals, is something that probably never existed and exists only in a world which denies the very others that they want to um, extol. Let me explain what I mean. One of the interesting things is everybody extols downtowns, the recreation of the vibrant center, and forget about South Bronx or East London. It's extraordinary how many left critics of the city in their desire to reframe the city forget that that city already exists and it's a city they don't want to live in. 
And I'm not saying they're wrong to not want to live there, but I'm saying that they, again, are privileging a piece, or they're privileging a part, or they're trying to think a city that is an abstracted world separate from the multiplicity of the world that surrounds them. We have people like Rem Koolhaas talking about architectures of erasure, the need for erasure. And I always find that ironic. I always wonder what people in South Bronx would think of an architecture of erasure. You all know South Bronx? It's, it, you don't have anything quite like it. But, you, know, it's, you have things that sort of border on it in England, but can anybody give me something in England that's like South Bronx? I don't know. I don't think you have it quite as bad. But an architecture of erasure is what the people in South Bronx already have and have had for 20 years. You think of people like Peter Eisenman in the same zone talking about the need for an architecture of conflict from his West 10th Street home in one of the wealthiest parts of New York City. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'd, I'd love to live on West 10th Street too, don't get me wrong. But it is this kind of separation that we have, which is an also an important part of this singularizing of the city that I'm talking about. I could go on and on and talk about this. We, talk, we have people like Grimm and others talking about generic cities. A lot of the people talked about the problem of cities all becoming like each other because of the universalizing tendency of international capital. One of the great ironies of international capital is that at the same moment that we've never been more unified in terms of the economics of the city, cities are extraordinarily different. The classic generic cities people talk about are LA. Has anybody been to LA? There's no place like LA. If that's a generic city, I want somebody to show me another LA. LA has, if London thinks it's cosmopolitan, people don't know this, that LA has the most ethnic groups of any city in the world. 135 racial and ethnic groups live in LA. I don't think people don't know that. Largest Samoan population outside of Samoa. Largest Mexican population outside of Mexico. Second largest Mexican city in the world, actually. I think it's the third largest Iranian city in the world now go on and on and on. So how do we speak of generic cities? They exist, but they don't exist at the same time. Now this is the part that I, I go on with, with architects, but I'm going to leave architects for a second. Although I will say this, the other great singularity we see of the city is so many architects and social theorists talking about the loss of public life and the coming of consumption, the coming of a consumer Disneyland world, which I find very frightening because in the zone, and then in TLS 10 years later, everybody's complaining about this new consumption world that we're all taken in by. I think the only people who appear to be taken in by Disneyland are the intellectuals who go to Disneyland and think it is a, a simulacra of a world that existed once. I have a lot of friends that go to Disneyland, and I don't like, I may not like why they go, but I don't know any of my working class or normal middle class friends who go to Disneyland and think it's a simulacra of anything. What they say is they go to Disneyland because it's fantasy. And it isn't like anything. And that may be good, bad, or indifferent, but it's very different than worrying, as Sharon Zukin does, that all of us are being taken in by this great consumption, this world of consumption, and being fooled by Disney. Maybe Sharon is being fooled by Disney, but the people I know aren't. There are other kinds of criticisms one can make of consumption, although these same people often extol the bazaars, the great public places of the past. What is a bazaar? Anybody been to bazaars in, 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 in the Middle East? World's largest shopping mall, right? No? That's what they are. Miles and miles. I remember going to Isfahan. I was going to see the bazaar. It's beautiful. It's nicer than the, the, the shopping malls I know in Boston. But what is it? It's miles and miles and miles of stores where people are not nice to you until you buy something, right? It's a, it's a, it's a mall, one of the original malls. Probably as large as, some of, as the Mall of America, actually, when you get right down to it, without the parking. I'm exaggerating, but I think it's important because it is this kind of imagination that we have to bring to cities. We have to open up the ironies, the conflicts, the contradictions that every space provides us, that every space sort of exhibits and sort of demonstrates. It's not just architects, by the way, who um, mystify cities and privilege different parts of it. I think of people like Christopher Lash, who underwrites the sort of new urban agenda. Do you all know who Christopher Lash is? He was a major American intellectual whose last book, In the Revolt of the Elites, talked about the wonders of the neighborhood and the neighborhood bar. 
Again, I grew up in the Lower East Side, and neighborhood bars are wonderful places if you're a member of the neighborhood. They're not so nice, and they're not so warm, and they're not so welcoming if you're the wrong color, the wrong class, or even simply not a member of the, a resident of the neighborhood. They're quite uh, xenophobic and can be extraordinarily mean-spirited. Even upper middle class bars. I learned this when I was doing field work in Canada and went back to Greenwich Village to a bar I'd always gone to, but I had long hair. And remember, people with long hair used to complain because they go to working class bars and workers would beat them up for having long hair. These guys almost beat me up because my hair was short. I was living in a mining town at the time and I walked in and they all gave me these ugly stares and said, what are you doing here? Now, I like bars, again. I'm not, you know, these, I'm not being critical of these places. What I'm saying is that there's this, this, this density of the world that most of our thinking and our images are not getting at and that we're avoiding. And it's true also, and, and equally as true for social scientists. Let me go through this very quickly and then show you some slides, which is what you really like to see. I like to see them, too. And. Uh, come back to what I think the slides tell us a little bit, and some suggestions for where we might go with uh, this knowledge of multiplicity and how we might confront it. If you look at social theorists of the cities, they can be divided up into three or four categories. Talk about singularizing. I'm good at that, too. The first and probably the most important is what I call production, is people like David Harvey, Dorian Massey, and others who believe the city is the result of some set of historical processes of production. And as much as David Harvey, in his most recent article in this journal, City, tries to deny it, it's, that's what it is. His understanding of the city is as a form produced through uh, political economies, which then have imp social and cultural implications. The second major form of city thinking by social scientists is what I call consumptionists, people like Manuel Castells, Peter Saunders, and others, who argue that cities, while certainly influenced by production, and the productionists think that consumption has something to do with production, but they emphasize and, s and really sort of revolve around production analogies. They argue that the city is really known for how it consumes schools, highways, and this is what defines urban politics, this is what defines urban form, this is what defines urban practices. That's specifically urban. Remember, this is a need. We'll see that as a problem, too, to define what is specifically urban. Others see it, feminists and cultural theorists and other sort of cultural commentators, see the city as a place of struggle constantly being carried out, places of resistance, a resistance to the structures of patriarchal or other kinds of power. And the city is the sum of cultural and social struggles which people undertake to make sense and to claim a place in that structure. It's a container of contested terrains. All of which is true, but not quite as true as they have it. I mean, one of the things when I'm done reading some of these people, and I, I respect them immensely, but there is this sort of so much seriousness about this, so much single-mindedness in seeing the city this way is you're done reading some of these people and you get very tired because you didn't realize your whole life has been this one massive constant struggle. This is Jewish humor. I know this. You know, I really get tired reading these people because, you know, I didn't know that that's what I'm doing all day. I didn't know when I'm watching television that I have to struggle against the forces of capital and patriarchy and cultural consumption. I thought I was trying to get to sleep, right? And I think, you know, they're not wrong, but it's this singularity. It's this privileging of this one piece of the city, this one piece of our lives, which distorts the fact that at the same time that we're doing this, Cities do other things as well, and you know most of us don't struggle and resist most of the time. We couldn't do it. Not even Rosa Luxemburg, who believed in going to the beach and sleeping. She took three weeks every year. Is that a bad reference these days, Rosa Luxemburg? You know, that, that ages me, you know, when you use references like that. All of these theories, all the architects who talk about the city, do have very revealing and powerful things to say. But as important and as powerful as the things they have to say are, they are dangerous precisely because they are powerful. 
They are dangerous in thinking about cities precisely because they are able to typify and to define so much of our lives in a very clear and concise way. It's true also for uh, the architects who write about cities. When we think even now of the most recent theorists, postmodern theorists, who want us to always think about others and think about multiplicity and think about difference, that is a singularization too. Because what they won't confront is the only time that difference is important is when people are extraordinarily unified. You know, people in non-complex societies don't worry about difference. <coughs> they don't. And people who are in traditional societies don't worry about tradition. You, ever, you know, you ever think about that? You go to a traditional society and say, what are your traditions? They look at you like you're crazy. You, you have to say, what's your life like? That's their traditions. They don't have this distortion or this divorcing because their world doesn't deal with that. You know, it's only in a world where we, we are entering into so many different places that these things become important. Others only become important when you want to be part of the whole. I'll give you an example. One of the interesting things I learned as an anthropologist is you go to a lot of places like in South Texas and all the intellectuals write about how we need to recognize the culture of others and the art of others. And what you find out is the people in South Texas could care less what people in the AA or Oxford or Harvard think of their culture. They're doing it. They're living it. For others, who do see themselves as sort of a larger international world, this becomes important. Now, I'm not saying that people in South Texas are unaffected by things that happen in the centers. I am saying, though, that the way we have to see, is see it is to understand that it doesn't, that, that otherness only means something, only is important, theoretically or otherwise, as a moment in unity. And it's because people in Harvard are so much a part of a larger culture that they do care about the fate of culture in South Texas or other places. The same thing, by the way, goes with spatial theorists who are the most recent one. I think Ed Soja was here recently. I don't know if he gave a general talk or not. Spatial theory has become a very interesting moment because spatial theory also was to essentially rid us of this singularity, to break out of the historicism of Marx and all the other social theorists who can't rid get out of language. But if you think about spatial theory, what's very interesting about it is that it is probably the most singular of all theories. One of the things I've just recently, this is something very new to me, when I read people like Jameson and Soja, I never see any space as I know it. Right? I mean, it's never everyday space. It's never quotidian, I like that word, quotidian space. I'm, that's what you have to say these days, quotidian, not everyday. Um, Tim O'Lacker said an imitation. And what you find interesting about spatial theory is that it doesn't want to recognize its necessity of singularizing text over practice. Let me explain what I mean very quickly. Space, if Einstein is right, is a concept about a condition. It doesn't exist. Space is the thing we use to define relationships that we see and feel and know about. It is an abstraction. In fact, it's a double abstraction because it is, the, it is the abstraction of a condition. It's not even the practice. And as a result, it brings us back into the singularity of words, which is a very important thing to me because, I, w as you'll see, one of the things that I'm trying to think about, and I don't have the answers, is how we break out of a dependence or privileging of social theory as words or architecture as visual reality. All right. These are all my criticisms. By the way, I have no solutions, but I'd love to have start with the criticism. You've got to start somewhere, right? The idea is that we have to break out of these privileging categories. But we have to break out of them in a way that doesn't deny any of the claims that these various theorists and architects make. So I want you to understand, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not saying David Harvey's wrong, Emmanuel Castells is wrong, or Sharon Zukin is wrong. They all are right in their way. They've all done very brilliant stuff. And, and I don't want to be one of those. It's not, I'm not trying to do, you know, patricide. I'm not trying to get rid of my intellectual, you know, forebears. I am saying, though, that we have to sort of break out of this kind of rigidity in the way we think about things and have a kind of sense of humor. Bad way of saying it. We have to break out of the rigidity. We have to break out of the language which, although we try to, uh, David Harvey desperately tries to move out of a notion of structure, but he always comes back to it, no matter how he tries, right? 
because local practices are always local practices, and then you get to the important theory. We have to break out, find the way to break out of it, and that's what I'm trying to think about. Let me show you some slides which I think may help us, <laughs> may not, I may blow, this is the double lecture. Show some slides which I think will give us a sense of what I mean. The slides are three kinds. They're places that show us the multiplicity of the world and show us why we have to sort of see this multiplicity. And then there's slides of people and architects who have tried to take advantage of this multiplicity. And I think it suggests some routes for architects to take and then some routes for uh, social theorists to take in trying to deal uh, with this multiplicity that I'm talking about. The slides also represent something that I think is very important. Foucault, in a very famous quote, talks about how we live in multiple sites. I won't read the quote because I'd have to find the text and I won't find it. But it's, a, it, it's a very perceptive quote. The problem with it is that he doesn't understand or seem to understand that those multiple sites may be in the same place. And that is the, probably the most important notion that one has to bring to bear in rethinking the city. So let's try the uh, slides, okay? Last time I did this, it was a disaster. Mark will remember they were upside down, <laughs> right side up, backwards. It, the slides are not my world, I hate to tell you this. Okay. I can't, now what do I do, I press these things? All right, let me find. Ah, they're funny slides. They're back, but they're all backwards. I can tell you this right now, so please live with me. Every single slide is backwards. How do you know? Oh, they are backwards. You can tell what. Well, every one of them is backwards. I put them in myself. They said, you got to do it yourself. I said, all right, you take the choice. You, you, you live with it. Campo de Fiori in Padua, Canal Street. I think they're very interesting slides because they are what I call uh, play synonyms. They're like, they act like synonyms. They're different places, different looks. But in many ways, they're also exactly the same thing. And what's fascinating about them for me is that they are local markets, and local markets play out a very interesting part of our cities. Most of us go to these things and say, wow, isn't it wonderful to go to a local market? You get over you know, the, the, the monopoly of capital. You get away from international capital. No, you're immersed in it. But you're immersed in it in a slightly different way than you are in a mall. But you're still about consumption. At the same time, as Raymond Williams always says, the city and the country are the same, but they're different. Going to a local market is different. Both are being played out here in both these places. Buying in a local market is not exactly like buying in Bloomingdale's. Uh, what's, the, what's the London equivalent of Bloomingdale's? You, you don't have a Bloomingdale's here, do you? It's another phenomenon. Anyways, all right. So that you, you have these layers, and you have these layers in different places that are not the same, but in fact, in many ways, are exactly the same. Same thing we said in an ironic, different way about these two spaces. This space, is this backwards too? No, probably, but you can't tell, so it doesn't matter. Um, Battery Park in New York City, public, publicly owned. Daniel Hall in Boston, private, privately owned. Here are spaces that appear to be different that ironically in later days, and this is sort of, might seem to run counter to what I'm arguing, but it is the irony of cities, which are in many ways exactly the same. Battery Park, has anybody been to Battery Park City? all made with public money, it is a place that is so highly guarded and designed to prevent poor people, homeless people, people that are different from getting to it, that it acts and operates like a private domain. Very self-consciously designed this way because this is the park that serves uh, the financial center. There's a wonderful building on the edge of it by Cesar Pelli, which he always likes to talk about as the great public space. It's the American Express building which is another reality of contemporary life. That is the private public space. It even makes that language almost irrelevant, and I think it's important to make that language relevant. Faneuil Hall is a place that is extraordinarily welcoming to people if you have money. Interesting the way it works. No one ever sees homeless people in Faneuil Hall, although it's very open, unlike Battery Park. The difference is in Battery Park, which is something I want to point out about cities and nostalgia, you can't kick people out. So you have to guard it. And you design it so that people can't get there who don't belong, who you don't want there. Faneuil Hall is private property. You can't kick people out. There are 75 security people in Faneuil Hall at all times. They're kept in the basement. Or they, they walk around in everyday clothes. And you don't know who they are. And they do escort homeless people out. 
Now, one of the great problems of contemporary life in the United States, a lot of people talk about the problem of public life and the loss of public life and how wonderful it was in the old days you had these public places. I was a kid growing up. There used to be a thing called vagrancy laws. Public places worked because if you didn't fit and you didn't have $7 in your pocket, you could be arrested. In the 1960s, the Supreme Court said you couldn't do that. In the 1960s, the American Supreme Court said you couldn't kick people out of libraries simply because they were sitting there to get out of the cold. Until that time, wonderful public spaces existed that we're tremendously nostalgic about precisely because libraries did call the police when homeless people came in them. I remember seeing it as a kid and were kicked out. So the public places had a different definition, a different reality than they do today. So we have to be very careful how we see these realities. I'm doing these as vignettes. The Palio Siena, Campo in Siena. I think a fascinating place. This one space, this one event plays out so many different levels of reality, it's extraordinary. It is a place of international tourism. It is a place of international media. I've been told in Europe this is one of the big events. You know, they have a TVs come and all of Italy, you know, watches it. It is also, according to my friends who are Italian and live in Siena, a place where the very local battles are being played out as they were 500 years ago. And this all is operating at exactly the same moment. And the same people are often the people acting it out. Does anybody know where this is? This one I love. Does anybody tell me where these two places are? Anybody? Come on. Take a guess. Yeah. God, somebody actually knows. Yeah, this is Tel Aviv. This is Jerusalem. This place I love because I, it's a picture that looks like your typical yuppie, you know, tourist quarter, right? Offhand, that's what you take it. It's a, it's a, it's a place of, of the ultra orthodox. Watch the powers. The uh, powers that be want to knock it down. 
room in LA. And you all know Watts Tower is an extraordinary architectural feat. The powers that you want to knock down. And they used it as an excuse that it wasn't safe. And then they brought up Derek and the chains broke. That, that took the kind of state away. Another place full of ironies. This is in Caracas. This is under a high-tech, modern highway. Very traditional activity. And this, of course, you all know what this is, right? I think it is, it is an amazing place if one has to, if one wanted to study all the layers of cities, in that at one level, it is a product of the most statist, the most modern form of capitalist, repressive interference in a city done by architects who are both very sensitive to people but willing to create a high-tech universe which represents that world. At the same time, it's extraordinary the street life that that place is resurrected. And how much and how much that is resurrected, even things that haven't been around Paris for a long time, medieval plays and people may able to play out sort of uh, everyday kind of artistic performances on the streets. So much so that that building, they have to close it down, and that's the most singly visited building. It was designed, I was told by Peter Rice, it was designed for 20,000, it was getting 60,000 people a day on the escalators. I find it, it's full of all those ironies, and all the criticisms that were dead, dead right. I mean, I have enough problem with the way you understand how that thing got put where it was, and how it was decided, and how it got named. It is what all the left critics said it was, but it's also a lot of other things at the same moment. I'm from New York, I believe in overkill, so I'm making it point. This is a wonderful garden. We're moving now into architects who take advantage of it. This is by George Hargraves. He's a landscape architect in California. And it would be kind of too. The soup. Uh, this is a this is a very formal park which borders on a black neighborhood, which he has made into a place for them in summer because they can't afford to go to the beach. Not everybody in California has a beach. So these fountains become the beach of the poor folks of San Jose. It's a wonderful. Garden. As you see, it's a very formally done piece, too. It does both. It tries to do with both. This is the one that's full of irons. Can anybody guess where this is from? Just wild. Just, you know, try. You can use Jerusalem. You can use Jerusalem. But this is the irony. Anybody know San Francisco? There's a place called, there's a baseball stadium, Candlestick Park. It's a baseball stadium. This is a field next to Candlestick Park. It's right next to the parking lot. Candlestick Park. It runs counter to everything that you would think about cities. It's right in the heart of San Francisco. This is a 
project by Samuel Mockby of Mockby and Coker, a very interesting southern architect you know, out of Memphis in Mississippi. This is for an older, it's a rural area, but it has some unique cities. The people in this town wanted some definition of land. So they created murals. They created wonderful murals, which became not definitions of land, become places to play, so that these interstices really become meaningful places, not really places of fear of art. You know, we always talk about the spaces in between. That was the space in between, which became an active space. Same thing with him here. <laughs> this dormer, so it's a slightly high art dormer, in a sharecropper's shed in Mississippi. It's something that's very important to me. It deals with it, something I'll come back to very briefly and we'll talk about. It. it shows how architects can do architecture for poor people. It, what it is, by the way, is it's a, it's a beautifully done dormer which became a study hall for the Johnson family's children because there wasn't enough room for them to work. And it's a one-room one shack. And that country thing is now put in by um, not Monty Coker's his partner in Memphis. It was a, it was a suggestion for uh, housing. It's not going so fast, but it's not very good for this. It's another one that I love. This is by Ellenswey, Harry Ellenswey, two places for college. He noticed that people like sitting on stairs. He may say more. So he made a long. Here is something typical, and this, is, this has become old man. He did this years ago, but this is the notion of the way stairs work in laboratories. Rothenstein places the stairs as places where people move. In most laboratories, it's where people talk. I know the GSD, more talking gets done, directly you know that, right, on the stairs than any place else. It's hard to move in the GSD because people are talking, and you feel sort of insulted that you say, could you please get out of my way? And look at you say, excuse me, I'm talking. You know, what do you think stairs are for? So that's what he did here. In both of those out there. This one I love. Station in Central Square in Cambridge, where I live. It's a very mixed neighborhood. One of the two mixed neighborhoods in Boston. A lot of poor people. When Harry Elmswide went to put this is a very beautiful, very expensive tile by like Japanese artists. The authorities didn't want it. They said this is a point of view. You can't do this here. He said, yes, you can. And he believed it. One of the few stations that's absolutely no refute. It never has. It's been around for about nine years. It's absolutely pristine. It's just taken about a year or two seven years after it's broken. This and both these places become major drug places at night. And it's going to sound, I don't, I don't, it sounds a little bit too precious, but I, I want to make a point here. So I'm not going to drug it. But what it proves to me is that drug pushes like nice places too. I mean, why? We, we, this is another thing we singularize. We singularize these people as some kind of camels, as these, these awful human things. They're not. They're entrepreneurs. They're trying to make a buck in a lousy way. But that's what they're doing. And they have as much a, a richness about them as anybody else. They're not merely drug pushers, which is a title, not a reality. But they are as complex, and their sites as are complex. And I'm not justifying drug pushing. I don't like it. And it's a scary place at night. But nonetheless, one should recognize that reality. This is uh, Edward Cullinan's hospital in Lambeth's uh, health center in, in Lambeth. I think it's about how you can make a health center into an amazingly complex and, and interesting place. It's a place that a lot of people go to for a lot of different reasons. Architects go to see the high art. It's, very, it's the most visited building in London for many years. When we first got done, the architecture and beauty architecture, we loved it. At the same time, it's a place that old people come and talk, kids play in the back, doctors come to work with people. It's a place that, I mean, and this is an extraordinary irony, which has third when it first happened. People come here to die. There's a hospice in here. People come to die. And, and people die, were dying faster than any place else in, in, in London. And at first, the architects were very upset about it until the psychiatrist said, no, I'll take it as a compliment. When people are very sick and dying, they often are in tremendous pain, and I'm serious. And, and they, they want to die. They don't want to be pain, but they want to put their life right. They want to make, they want to say their goodbyes. They want to get their business done. And this rooms in this place were so good and so, so welcoming to everybody. We dealt with all the layers that went on in life 
that people were able to do it and get on with the business of design, something our society can't do. Let me go quickly through this. This is Buckhead in Atlanta. Old mansions, Elton John was The story is about a library by Mac Scoggin, the Scoggin in the Bray. What's interesting about Mac is he does libraries that do immensely complex and multiple things. This is a library that nobody wanted to build because it's on a strip where rich people come and pick people up. Max said, hey, why don't we use this as an opportunity? What the library, what he did with the library is, hey, it's got, you can't see it, but it's got the best view of Atlanta down out of this room, which people come for. At night, it's right next to this very busy strip. And he said to the people who ran the library, why not make the, the, the parking lot pick a point after 6 o'clock? So between 8 and 6, parking is free if you're using the library. Library closes between 6 and the next morning, you have to pay 10 bucks. But it is one of the most important pickup points in, in Buckhead, which is the main development of land. This is the view you get from the library. And the library at the same time is extraordinarily functional and wins all the librarians love. You can make great libraries and do other things. Finally, very quickly, this is a, a, a a monument for uh, that's a Dante in uh, general. It's the Columbus Monument, which is the prize winning done by Sovetti and Charles Sovetti. What I like about it is the monument that is not just a monument, it actually operates. You can walk through it and get the city back together. It did a lot of different things in the same place. But what's most important to me about it, I'm going to go very fast, and that's it. Yeah. What's most important about it for me, it's very spectacular. I love these lines too. Um, this summarizes why we live in complex world. This is a monument in Italy for a man who was funded by Spain, who colonized what we came to know as a new world by Italian Argentine architects trained in Berkeley teaching in Argentina. Poor Italian city. Impresses me. And finally, as much as things are different, things are shared. Italy and China.
The question then becomes, and you see that in the slides too, the question then becomes, how do you begin to describe it? Now, one of the ways we, to start describing it is to recognize that when Lefebvre says, I'm really Lefebvre, he says, everyone knows what is meant when we speak of a room in an apartment, the corner of a street, a marketplace, or a shopping or cultural center, a public place, and so on. And he's absolutely right. But at the same time, the problem is that what everybody knows it means may not be the same. The same place that we can all identify and recognize, that we'll all participate in at one moment, often can become the site of extraordinarily antimonium, that's a big word, conflicting discourses and contradictory and conflicting practices. No place, no thing, no structure in the city is singular. The problem, though, that we've had up to now in talking about this, although we all recognize it, is the very categories we use to inform us about the city deny that multiplicity. We talk about urban and suburb. We talk about center and margin. We talk about urbanization, urbanism. What makes something a suburb? It's an interesting notion. It privileges a statement that somehow this thing in the center is the earth. What made it the earth it was a choice of a group of people. I always think of Rem Kuhlhaus's state in that Manhattan is the site of desire, right? It may be for Rem, but I lived in Queens, and I think it's for me too. A man growing up wanted to be hot like everybody else. But the people in my neighborhood in Queens, my parents' neighborhood in Queens, who could see Manhattan every day had the best view of Manhattan, maybe once, once or twice in their lives. It was irrelevant to their existence. Was as relevant to their existence as someone from Omaha in terms of their perception of self. So it seems to me we need to get away from categorizing cities in the traditional ways. And I don't know how to do it, but I will suggest very quickly, and for your criticism and attack or whatever, some ways of doing it, some rules we're doing. The most important rule, I think, is that for every turn we make about the city, you have to allow for the reality of its opposite or its other. That's a fancy way of saying it. So for example, if you believe in um, a to total city, you have to believe in a partial city. You have to allow for that possibility. If you believe in an abstract city, you have to believe and talk about a grounded city. If you believe in a city or talk about a city, I can, it doesn't matter, a spatial city, you have to believe in an anti-spatial city, which I think, by the way, does exist. If you believe in a known city, you have to talk about an unknown city. If you talk about a structured city, you have to talk about a destructured city. Not just that you note them, not that you just simply say, oh, I, I, these two words are opposites, but that your task has to be to be able, if you describe one, you have to be able to describe the other. If you can't, then the category is not useful. And they have to be done in a way where the one is not privileging the other. It has to be able to work both ways. And it doesn't actually have to be binary, by the way go and hopefully move beyond binary distinctions. So you might want to talk about a city of intended places and a city of intended no places because you have a, you have a city that's in, that comes from people's intentions and you have cities that the same city exists because of non-intended reasons. There were no intentions. Things happen. Have you ever seen that great movie, Things Happen? With Don Amici and it's about an old man who goes and he bets and he loses it all. And it was called Things Change. It looks like he says things change. He just won like a half a million dollars and loses all at once. Right? You have to be able to recognize that reality at the same moment. If you do this, and this is how I'll come to my second. It's not fair to you, it's always hot room. If you do this, as architects, both as social theorists and architects, but as I think as architects, you will find many new places for practice. Because one of the implications of what I think I'm arguing, I have no idea. What I, what, what I think the argument implies is that you will no longer valorize or privilege certain forms of architecture. Let me explain what I mean. One of the problems we have is that we do live in a world of power. And power, to a great extent, will define where big buildings go. Power will define what kind of buildings are given the most money, who's paid the most money, and so on and so forth. But power does not have to valorize what's an important building. That is up to architects. Community buildings, small buildings, uh, unambitious buildings, buildings outside the center, 
work outside the center is as important, should be considered as important, and could be valorized just as much as any other work. That is not up to power. It is only because we singularize, and even as if people who are critics of the left, we buy into that world that we valorize the work, that, and then get angry that we are motivated and defined by power. But nothing says in the world that we have to singularize that. Nothing says we have to valorize it. We may do it, but nothing says we have to valorize it. Cultural valoration comes from many, many different sources. Like the, like the, like the Conjunto Sinkers in, in, in San Antonio, you do not have to worry what the New York Times thinks of you. You do not have to worry that you get a great review in some important magazine. Or you can make the situation the important magazines, those that come and review and valorize what you think is important. At the same moment, this is where I think multiplicity is important. It's not done naively. It's done understanding full well your position within a world which is unified and controlled to a great extent by power. That, that doesn't go away because you valorize something else. And so the same thing for social theory. In understanding a piece or a totality or any part of it, it becomes important that we not throw out the other parts. That when privileging a moment, we don't naively throw out the other moments. And that's what I think we've been doing up to now. Last thing. I think there's a role that architects and visualizers and others have to play in all this for me. And something that's come to, hard for me to, to, to admit, because for years I said that representations other than language were basically secondary. One of the things that social theory does, and people like me do, is that we valorize and privilege verbal languages. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that new social theories will be able to really confront the multiplicity as long as they valorize language alone as the privilege, you know, verbal language, excuse me, verbal language as the privileged means of communicating and understanding social reality and urban, of which urban reality is a part. We have to find a way of using visual worlds to add to it. Because the point to me is very clear that visual worlds allow us to engage simultaneity, but they don't allow us to understand send that simultaneity analytically. At the same time, we have to be able to take that visual world and make it a part of our verbal language. And that's the task I think that lies ahead for both social theorists and architects and others who really want to engage the city as an ongoing, real, and multiple process. I'm sorry that it, it, it's, it's vague, because this my, I've just started to think this way. I come out of a very materialist, very neo-Marxist. I knew the answers until about two years ago. I knew what made cities happen. I used to teach David Harvey and others like that religiously. Still do, but don't buy it as much. As brilliant as it is, it became extremely unsatisfactory. On the other hand, I'm too much of an old fart materialist to buy into the new theories of postmodernism where no structures exist. And it's all this blaze of symbols and ideas and, and language. I think it lies not in between, but it lies together. It's all going on at the same time, and that's what we have to confront um, to create a real understanding of cities and to create a set of practices for people that really allow them to be what in Khan's word said they want to be. I'll end with that. Thank you.